Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fries from Central New Mexico Community College, continuing with the videos on the heart. And with this video F, we're starting on heart physiology with a focus on what creates the heartbeat. We just learned in the previous video about the microscopic anatomy of cardiac muscle tissue. And clearly, a heartbeat is the result of the contraction of that heart muscle tissue. But at the same time, that heart muscle tissue must become stimulated somehow, depolarized somehow, in order to be able to contract. So for that, we will need to take a closer look at the cells that make up the cardiac muscle tissue. There are actually two types of muscle cells present. And the majority of these muscle cells are your typical contractile fibers that will be depolarized as a result of action potentials that arrive from them from yet another group of muscle cells that make only about make up only about a percentage of the heart muscle tissue. And we refer to these cells as autorhythmic cells or pacemaker cells. They're called autorhythmic because all by themselves, without the help of the nervous system, they succeed in depolarizing. So they have no help from the nervous system in order to, de to depolarize. They can do this all on their own. And they therefore can also be called the pacemaker cells because literally they set the pace at which depolarization occurs. Now, am I saying that the heart is not innervated by any fibers from the autonomic nervous system? No, I'm not saying that. As a matter of fact, the heart is innervated. But we will look at the extrinsic nervous system of the heart later on. So we're going to focus on just the contractile muscle cells and they act very similarly as skeletal muscle fibers. You might recall that skeletal muscle fibers require an action potential from the somatic nervous system uh, with the help of the binding of acetylcholine. Well, the action potential for cardiac muscle cells arrives from the autorhythmic cells. And again, we will look at those autorhythmic cells in the next video. But when this action potential from the autorhythmic cells causes um, depolarization in our contractile muscle cells, it is again due to the influx of sodium ions. Nothing new. We've seen that before. Influx of sodium ions with maybe a little bit of leaking out of potassium ions, but primarily the influx of sodium ions. We then see that the action potential, just like we saw in skeletal muscle, will propagate down into the T-tubules, where the T-tubules are in close uh, contact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum will then open up its voltage-gated ion channels to release calcium, which is then dumped into the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber, whether we're talking skeletal or cardiac muscle tissue. Remember, the sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. Don't forget that. Of a uh, muscle cell, and a muscle cell is also called a fiber, a muscle fiber. It's very important. You know all of this terminology so you don't get confused. And then, of course, that leads to the excitation contractual contraction phenomenon where when the action potential um, triggers the release of the calcium, the calcium, that electrical signal and that release of calcium will then lead to the binding of calcium to troponin complexes in the thin filaments. Then the thick filaments heads can bind to the thin filaments and finally, we see that the myofilaments, that is the thick, or I'm sorry, the thin filaments slide along the thin filaments. If it's been a while since you've had anatomy and physi physiology one, you should go back to this information. 
you have access to my YouTube channel so you can just look for uh, skeletal muscle physiology to do a quick review on how all of this works. There are some differences between how cardiac muscle tissue and skeletal muscle tissue contract. So let's take a look at those. Skeletal muscle cells, as I've explained earlier, are electrically isolated. That is not the case for cardiac muscle cells, which are electrically connected by means of this, those intercalated discs that contain gap junctions. So ions can easily travel from cell to cell, and therefore currents can travel from cell to cell. Potentials, whether they're graded potentials or action potentials, can easily move from cell to cell. And because of that, all of the heart cells tend to contract almost simultaneously. And so we could say that the heart acts as a syncytium, literally meaning together all the cells, the cells are all contracting almost simultaneously. And I mean, there's a little bit of a um, progression in when the cells contract, which we'll see soon, sooner rather than later. And of course, in the, in the case of skeletal muscle tissue, the, the stimulus is actually arriving from the axonal terminals that belong to the somatic nervous system. And that is not the case in the, in the heart, where it's the autorhythmic cells, which are those specialized muscle cells that um, uh, create an action potential, which is then passed on to the contractile cells such that they generate an action potential. And then finally, we'll see this on a graph very soon, the length of the action potential in cardiac muscle tissue is very long. And the reason for why this must occur is so that the heart will constantly contract and relax, contract and relax, contract and relax. So there's no tetanus in the heart. The heart is not going to act, for instance, like your biceps brachii that can lift up your backpack and hold on to your backpack for like five minutes in that contracted state. It wouldn't be a good thing for the heart to do that. And, and again, why we see that the heart can do the beating action rather than main, uh, maintaining a contraction for a long period of time will become clearer with the graphs that we're about to study. There's one more difference that I really need to mention, and that is the the sources of calcium. In skeletal muscle, calcium only was provided by the terminal cisterni, which are part of the, the sarcoplasma. And we see that in heart muscle as well. So the calcium in both heart muscle and skeletal muscle tissue is provided by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But in heart muscle, we see that it's also provided by the extracellular fluid. And it's because there is this additional source of calcium that there is enough calcium able to start binding to the troponin complexes during the plateau of the action potential. So here we're looking at what the action potential looks like in the heart of the contractile cells. So make sure that you don't lose track, track of which cells we're looking at. We're just focusing on the contractile cells, which make up the majority of the muscle cells in cardiac muscle tissue. And right away, I'm sure you notice this plateau. And that is very different from what we see as the action potential in skeletal muscle. In skeletal muscle, the action potential would, as you follow my cursor, look very much like this. We reach a peak and then we come back down, right? So let's see what causes that plateau. The action potential that arrives from the pacemaker cells is slowly but surely going to cause the resting membrane potential of minus 90 millivolts of heart muscle tissue uh, to start being disturbed to the point that we see some depolarization occurring here. And then when we see approximately 15 millivolts, maybe um, 20 millivolts increase in our uh, resting membrane potential, so when we get to about minus 75, maybe 
uh, minus 70 millivolts, we reach threshold voltage. Remember, we learned about that in an intro, I'm sorry, in AMP1. And that opens up our voltage gated channels, our sodium voltage gated channels right here. And that leads to more and more sodium vo voltage gated ion channels opening. Once again, this is very much a positive feedback mechanism that we see occurring here. Very quickly, the influx of sodium turns the inside of our cell much more positive compared to the outside of the cell. So this is where we see depolarization occurring to the point that the membrane potential reaches a peak of plus 30. This is very similar to what we saw in skeletal muscle. But what we now see happening is that as the sodium channels begin to close, as the sodium voltage gated channels begin to close, we do see that also calcium channels begin to open. And they're kind of sluggish, so they're much slower calcium voltage gated channels. And as the calcium now again follows its um, direction, um, of um, gradient, concentration gradient, meaning it will also flow into the cell. Both sodium and calcium are much higher in concentration outside of our cells. Um, that is going to help maintain that depolarization. I mean, it's going to slowly drop, but very, very slowly. So to the point that we have almost um, a constant level of depolarization here. That's what we refer to as our plateau. And eventually those voltage-gated calcium channels do begin to close. And next we see that our calcium voltage-gated channels open, just like we saw in a, an action potential for skeletal muscle or even a neuron. And of course, it is on the inside that we have a higher level of potassium ion channels compared to the outside. And so when these potassium ions flow out of the cell, they take with them all of the, the positive charges that earlier had flowed into the cell and repolarize our muscle cell to the point that we eventually go back to resting conditions. Now, because of this plateau, we actually have a very long refractory period in the heart. And of that refractory period, you see here in the purple, we have even a long absolute refractory period, meaning that during that time, our cell is so depolarized still that it is impossible for a whole new action potential to fire. And so we can only see that a new action potential might be able to fire during this relative action potential and more than likely not until the action potential has completely finished. Now, another major difference that we see in our heart muscle cells, our contractile heart muscle cells, is that our heart muscle cells actually begin to contract already during this plateau. In skeletal muscle, our action potential had to completely finish before contraction could occur. Here we're going to see that soon after the calcium channels have begun to open, the physical contraction of the heart can already begin to occur. Here then we see the comparison of action potentials in skeletal muscle versus cardiac muscle. Uh, the action potential in skeletal muscle is very similar to what you learned about in neurophysiology, except that the resting membrane potential is closer to minus 90. In skeletal muscle, minus 85 to minus 90, almost the same resting membrane potential as in cardiac muscle tissue. We see that we reach um, our peak of our action potential when there's about 100 millivolts difference between resting membrane potential and um, peak of the action potential. And then we see that in skeletal muscle, immediately after the action potential, 
has reached its peak, meaning after um, all of the, the maximum amount of sodium ions have flowed in, flown in, we see that potassium channels open um, to where we see repolarization immediately following. Here, on the other hand, we see that the depolarization persists for quite a while. Um, uh, of course, we're talking milliseconds here. But, and that persistence in the depolarization during this plateau uh, can occur due to the fact that in addition to sodium ion channels that open, we also see calcium ion channels that open. Also, as a quick, quick review, if this is a cell, we see that on the inside of the cell, potassium ions are always in a higher concentration than um, on the inside of a cell compared to the outside. But when we look at calcium ions or we look at um, sodium ions, we see that sodium ions and calcium ions are much higher in concentration on the outside of cells. And so calcium can flow in along its concentration gradient, sodium can flow in along its concentration gradient, and potassium will flow out. You need to have this memorized, these concentration gradients, which you were introduced to in AMP1. The bottom graphs then focus more on the physical contracting response of the muscle cells. So the top figures focus on the electrical events that we cannot see but with, with our eyes, obviously. But when we look at the tension that develops in our heart muscle cells or skeletal muscle cells, that's something we can literally, literally witness. And so contraction in skeletal muscle tissue uh, typically doesn't start until the action potential is pretty much done. And it's a really short contraction. While contraction of the heart starts already during the plateau of our action potential and um, continues for, sev for two, three hundred milliseconds. Notice that the length of time for a skeletal muscle cell to contract is well below 100 milliseconds, so huge difference there. So the extended length or that long refractory period that we see in cardiac cells um, makes sure that um, heart muscle can fully contract. I should also add, unlike what we see in skeletal muscle where the <clears throat> action potential have, has to literally finish first before contraction occurs, in cardiac muscle cells, notice that contraction occurs well in the middle of our action potential. And that has to do with the fact that calcium ions are provided not just by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but also flow in from the extracellular fluid. So because of that, because we have all of that calcium that becomes available to the um, troponin complexes quite rapidly from the, extra, the calcium from the extracellular flu fluid, uh, we can see that the filaments begin to slide much earlier on. In skeletal muscle, the calcium can only come from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and therefore that action potential has to finish first, open up the voltage-gated channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum's terminal cisterni, release the calcium in the sarcoplasm, and then that calcium can cause the sliding filament theory. In the heart muscle cells, we see that happening as well, but we see direct influx of calcium into the sarcoplasm, and that calcium can go straight after those troponin complexes. So here we see nice, simple sketches of the heart's action potential in the contractile cells. Very easy to recognize because of the plateau here, right? And then in the bottom graph, we very nicely see the change in permeability of first the sodium ions. Notice how fast they flow into the cell. That is then followed by the flowing in much slower of calcium ions. And then we see eventually the flow in, I'm sorry, the flow outward of uh, potassium ions. So sodium flows in, calcium flows in, and potassium 
which is this one right here, is going to flow out of the cell, causing repolarization. Now, these two questions on your left are something to think about. Remember, after these ions have done all their flowing in and flowing out, the whole concentration gradient for each one of these ions is very much out of whack, even though we have repolarized. We've returned the cell to its resting membrane potential at the end of an action potential, but the concentration gradients are off. And remember, what fixes these concentration gradients is the sodium-potassium pump. And we're going to see that there are also, in this case of the heart, calcium pumps as well. Remember, pumps, ion pumps always pump ions against their concentration gradient. So how do these pumps uh, relate to heart attacks? Well, pumps are always going to require ATP. If a person has blockage in, her, in his or her coronary arteries to where the blood cannot provide enough oxygen to the contractile cells, these contractile cells do not have, ox have access to oxygen. If they don't have access to oxygen, they cannot produce enough ATP. If they do not produce enough ATP, these pumps can't function. And consequently, the heart cannot restore its concentration gradients. And if it doesn't do that, it certainly cannot start causing these ions to flow along their concentration gradients, and the heart stops beating. So this wraps up the contractile cells. We're next going to focus on those autorhythmic cells or pacemaker cells and see how they create or how they generate their action potential.